Thank you very much, Marcel. Um, <clears throat> it's a great honor and a big pleasure for me to open this third and last keynote of this 16th IPRESS conference. And I'm sure you all agree with me that this has been a wonderful, exciting conference. And that's exactly how we are going to continue with another exciting keynote by Elliot Higgins. Elliot will talk about um, Belly Cat and beyond. Um, you shortly will all know the legend about the group of mice who gathered um, and discussed about um, putting a bell around the cat's neck in order to be warned by its approach, which actually seems like a very good idea, but um, the problem was that no mouse wanted to volunteer because all of them were scared. Elliot isn't. Elliot isn't scared. He isn't scared of finding out the truth, of showing the truth, and of proving the truth, even if I think he's stepping sometimes on someone's feet. Um, and I like the link, um, to make the link between our first keynote on Tuesday um, from Gert Lovink, who showed us how social media um, can promote sadness. And um, Elliot today, I think, will show us how social media, if used in an intelligent way, and I think that's the important bit, um, can promote truth. And um, so Elliot has reinvented um, investigative journalism by using online open source information and making very important, um, so key findings in many important cases. Um, cases, strategies that we heard all about in the news. And I just want to mention one example, which is the case of MH17, um, the Malaysian um, airline flight that has been shot in the Ukraine. I think it even departed from Amsterdam. Um, Elliot and his team have helped to find out the real truth. And um, yeah, and, and there are many, many other cases which you will find on Wikipedia. Um, there's a long link list with all details. Um, but actually what you won't find on Wikipedia yet is that Elliot is writing a book. And um, I hope that there will be a digital version of this book as a librarian. <laughs> and I hope that many of us memory institutions here in this room um, will preserve that digital book as well. But um, actually, that's not the only um, connection Elliot has to digital preservation. Um, in his recent work on Yemen, um, archiving is a big component, he told me. So he will talk about this project. And I think it will be very interesting to um, discuss later on how those two communities, so um, on one side, the only online open source investigators, how Elliot likes to call them, and us, the digital preservationists, can work together, how those two communities can work together, how we can help each other, how we can support each other. Um, on one way to find out um, to continuing finding out the real truth and for us to be able to collect and preserve that real truth in our archives, in our long-term archives, with the common goal um, to give future generations access to the truth we know is true today. So <laughs> it's a big pleasure um, to welcome here you here, Elliot. Please give him a big applause and the floor is yours. Um, hello everyone, I'm uh, Elliot Higgins, I'm the founder of Bellingcat. Um, I'm going to take you through today um, where Bellingcat basically came from, why we do the work we do and what we have planned for the future. Now, um, I started um, doing what I'm doing, I didn't have a professional background in journalism or investigation, I just had an interest in what was happening um, online in regards to the conflict in Libya back in 2011. I was the kind of person who spent a lot of time on the internet arguing about various things that were happening um, and Libya was one of the topics that caught my eye. Um, 
there were lots of videos and photographs being shared online, lots of debate about this. And um, one time I shared a video and someone said to me, how do you know where that was filmed? How do you know they're telling the truth? And I thought, well, actually, how do I know that? So I had to think and I thought, well, um, maybe I can find out exactly where it's filmed by looking at the video. So in this example, this is um, pretty much the first video I ever geolocated. And what you have here is a tank. It's rolling down a street. Uh, it's next to a mosque with a dome and a minaret. And it was claimed by Libyan rebels they had captured this town called Tiji. So I, looking at this, I thought, well, we have this mosque and it has this dome and this minaret. It's you know, going to be quite large and it's next to a road. There's two lanes of traffic. There's a, a divider down the middle. There's a tank, which is obviously quite wide and it fits quite nicely. So I thought, why don't I look at TG and look for the biggest road that's visible? And thanks to Google Earth, this is something you can do at home. So here's the town itself and you can actually zoom in and see this road. There's two lanes of traffic. There's a divider down the middle. There's cars, which allow you to get a sense of the width of the road. And if you follow that road along, very soon you come to a mosque with a dome and a minaret. Um, but once you have a location, you can start looking at smaller and smaller details. So for example, we can use the position of the minaret and the dome to tell us the position of the camera, because the only way you could get that view is from the bottom right-hand corner next to the road. Then we can start looking at smaller and smaller details. We can look at the wall that's visible. We can look at the way the um, pavement curves into the mosque area and there's a discoloration between the two sides. You can look at utility poles and the shadows they're casting. So what I learned is you could start with these big clues that it was in TG, it's a mosque next to a road, and then start narrowing it down piece by piece, looking at smaller and smaller details. Um, so this was a bit of a revelation for me. And um, several months later, I started a blog called the Brown Moses blog named after a Frank Zappa song, which was awkward to explain to CNN a year later when I got a bit more well known. Um, so um, I started looking at videos from the conflict in Syria. And in Syria, what you had was um, a situation where local armed groups, local um, coordination committees, uh, NGOs and media centers had their own YouTube channels. And they would post it quite systematically on about a thousand YouTube channels. So you could catalog those and every single day look at the latest videos. And I was probably one of the first people to figure that you could actually do this. Um, so I would post about interesting videos. And this was an interesting video that was posted um, back in August 2012. And this is the first ever video of what's known as a barrel bomb. So a barrel, barrel bomb is an improvised explosive device. It's used by the Syrian Air Force, um, and it's pushed out the back of helicopters. The thing is, you look at that, and what you're probably thinking is someone's pushed over a bin. And there was a lot of cynicism around these claims. You had Russia Today publishing things like barrel bomb baloney, claiming it was completely untrue, that the Syrian Air Force would never use such a thing. But because I was systematically watching these videos, I came across videos like this one. Um, this shows a hip transport hel helicopter, and you see an object push out of the rear of a helicopter. And this appears to be a barrel bomb, and we can confirm it even further by this video, filmed inside a hip transport helicopter, where someone lights a cigarette, and pushes the bomb out the back of the helicopter. But of course, how do we know where this is filmed is the question everyone is asking. Well, we actually have something very, very useful here. We have a top-down view of the town they're dropping the bomb on. So we can take that, and then we basically play a really big version of Spot the Difference with this image and all of Syria. And l <laughs> after a while, you can find the location. If we rotate this, you can actually see that side by side overlaid that the road layout, all the details match. It's exactly the same location. So this is another way that we can use this information to confirm where these places took place. Now, um, this is something that came up a few years later when Russia started bombing Syria in September 2015. Um, they said they were there to bomb ISIS and support the Syrian government, but very early on people said these bombs aren't being dropped on ISIS-controlled territory, they're being bombed elsewhere. So Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, said, do not listen to the Pentagon about Russian airstrikes, ask the Russian Ministry of Defense. And in a way, that's what we did, because the Russian MOD started posting videos online like this. And they posted many, many of these videos online, um, showing their airstrikes in Syria. And they frequently described these as being ISIS targets within Syria. 
So there was a small group of people on Twitter and they got very interested in these videos and they started a new hobby, which is basically doing what uh, we had done with the Bow Bomb video, looking through all the satellite imagery of Syria, looking for where these locations were. And we saw that they were doing this and we started talking to them and said, let's do this in a very systematic fashion. We'll start a process where we can take one video from the Russian MOD and then give you, say, we want the coordinates of where it was filmed, where they claimed it was filmed, and if it supports the claims they're making. So, from the first 30 videos that were published online by the Russian Ministry of Defense, um, this group of people geolocated them, we double-checked it, um, and only one of them was correctly identified as being in ISIS-controlled areas. Now, you might think, well, how do you know who controls ISIS-controlled areas and who doesn't? Well, the Russian MOD came to the rescue again and provided this map that shows the control of Syria. So we could take that map and again go back to Google Earth, which is a favorite tool of ours, and overlay it with the map of Syria and then sketch around all these areas of control and have this very useful Google Earth overlay. Now, the area in uh, black is ISIS-controlled territory. Just to the north, you have this orange Kurdish-controlled area, and to the west, this green area, which is controlled by non-ISIS rebel forces. And this is according to the Russian Ministry of Defense. Now, we look at this video. This is one of these airstrike videos. Russia claimed that this was an ISIS facility being bombed, very clearly. And we have a video of this actually from the ground showing the same moment as it's being bombed. So this is quite an unusual incident because we have the Russian ROD zone footage and this footage. So you can see very, see very clearly it's bombed. Now, where is this? Well, it was geolocated and we can look here what happens when we zoom to the location it was bombed in. So as you can see, we're going past the ISIS control territory into this non-ISIS control territory and this is according to the Russian MOD. And in fact, what we see here is not an ISIS facility, but this is actually a bakery that was run by a Turkish charity called the IHH. So the Russians actually posted evidence online of them bombing a bakery in non-ISIS held territory. Um, so we continue to look at airstrikes in Syria. And this is a case study where there was an allegation that there was a bombing in um, Syria and the White Helmets put together a video with the Guardian that showed what happened. And this is the video published by the Guardian. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا أمتي الجلال تاريخ عشرين عشر عشرين خمسة عشر قام طيران الحرب الروسي بشأن الغارة على مدينة سرنين فتبين أن الغارة استهدفت مدرسة هي ملاصقة للمشفى الميداني ولله الحمد أن المدرسة كانت خارجة عن العمل بسبب القصف الصارخ بين المدرسة كانت دفاع الدفاع المدني كانت تعرف قبل ما تشن الغارة سواء تقايد عم تطلب من الناس أن تروح من هناك وأنا بالع وأنا بالواقع عم تصور ال الغارة فهون شن الطيران ضرب فضرب في الموقع اللي أنا فيه على بعد نترين أو ثلاث بختار في الصاروخ مني أو أنا وياه الصاروخ أنا حسيت إن جسمي بدي تنزق من الضغط مقابل الأرض كل الناس عم تسمع صوت عيال والناس ما ينتبه علي إنه فيهم واحد مصار كان في شزير الصدر وحروب بإيد اليسار وشزاية بإيد اليمين وإجر اليسار بالإضافة إلى ردود في كل الجسم والصدر وشق كبير بال بالفك السفلي إضافة إلى شق بالعين الله أكبر أنت مضطر أن تتوجه للموقع سواء أنت تعاملك كموصي أو أنت عملك كرجل موقيس أو مسعي لأنه في ناس بحاجتك So um, following these allegations, the Russian Ministry of Defense responded and they published this image here, which is an aerial image of location they said was bombed or was allegedly bombed. And Russia Today picked up on this and um, reported on it. But was a recently alleged that Russian jets destroyed a hospital in the city of Samin, uh, causing the Russian Defense Ministry to, uh, well, call on journalists to double check the stories they publish. 
I call on the respected mass media not to jeopardise their reputation by publishing fakes like this. But it's not just the media. The accusations are actually picked up by the US State Department. And to prove the hospital is t totally intact, uh, the Russian Defence Ministry provided up-to-date satellite photographs. The building on this image, dated October 31st, does not look like it was recently bombed. How can we tell if it's the hospital in Sarbin? A year ago, a video was posted on YouTube that shows the hospital under construction. Here's a screenshot from that year-old video. And here is the Russian Defense Ministry's aerial image of what it says is the hospital. We see a similar dome-shaped structure next to the building. On both images, we see a wall or a fence positioned in a similar way. So where exactly is the hospital that Russia is accused of hitting? So um, there's two very different narratives about what happened there. So we want to look at this uh, very closely. So the first thing we want to do is establish we're talking about the same location in both the Russian video and the uh, or Russian satellite imagery and the white helmets image. So we can overlay the Russian image here and we look a bit more closely at the um, white helmets image. So the left is the white helmets video and the Sarmin hospital is just to the left of the frame here. We can look at some details in the background. Now, on the right-hand side, we have a satellite image from before the airstrike. And the photographer was uh, pointing to the north. This green spot is where he was stood when the bomb exploded. And what's interesting are the objects behind it. We can see on the right-hand side, on the satellite image, this small square structure. This is visible here. We can also see the shadow of four utility poles being cast. And you can see those utility poles here. And behind that, there's a wall, and you can see that here as well. Now, if we go back to the video, we can see the utility poles here and the, um, the wall here. And the bomb lands very close to those locations. So after that, some people went to that location and filmed more footage. And what this allows us to see is the damage done by that second bomb. Now, again, the right-hand image is from before the bomb was dropped. So we can see that the blue structure, the, or the structure marked in blue, has been completely demolished by the explosion. We can see the utility poles behind it are, are also there. And if we look behind it, we can see um, oh, sorry, I should say the utility poles, two of them have been knocked down, two of them are still standing, and the wall behind it has also been completely knocked down. So, let's look at the Russian image again. Now, there's a few problems here, because this image, supposedly from after the airstrikes, shows the building still standing. We can see four utility poles still standing. We can see the wall behind it is still standing. What this tells us is the Russians have used imagery from before the airstrike to claim the airstrike didn't actually happen. And I encourage anyone who wants to learn how to do open source investigations to fact check these Russian press conferences because there are multiple examples of Russia presenting this kind of evidence and it turning out to be false. It happened in the case of Syria and multiple airstrikes. It's happened with MH17 where they presented imagery that turned out to be false. Um, so this is where fact checking this information can be very useful. Now, because of the work we've been doing, we've caught the eye of various um, bodies. We've um, been working with the International Criminal Court on how open source investigation can be applied to the work that they do. And there was a very interesting case in 2017 uh, when an arrest warrant was issued. Uh, this arrest warrant was for a commander of the al Saka Brigade in Benghazi in Libya. And the commander, Wafali, had been accused of executing prisoners. How do you know these executions took place? Well, they filmed them and put them onto Facebook. Um, so they issued this arrest warrant based off those videos. And we started looking at these videos and seeing what information we could extract. I will warn everyone in the audience, there is some blood in this next uh, video, um, just so that you're forewarned. So in this video, we're going to demonstrate how we geolocated a video. And this video was the sixth video in a sequence of um, six videos where, uh, as you can see, there's a number of men lined up. These men are executed and we're finally as they're reading uh, their, basically the documents they have. The first thing we did is we extracted the frames from the video and merged them into one large image. This means that rather than cycling back and forth in the video, we can see the whole scene in one image. So we started looking for details in this image. Um, we looked for things like uh, buildings that are visible in the background, a wall that's visible, and a dirt road. 
Now, that's not much to go on, but we know they were fighting in Benghazi, and previously they had posted these photographs on Facebook, where they'd been recently fighting in an area called the Chinese building area. And these buildings look similar to what we could see in the background, so we made the best guess that this was a possible location. We then had to find that location. Um, fortunately, it had been marked clearly on Wikimapia as this location here, and as you zoom in, you can see there's lots of partly constructed buildings there. So we're looking for a wide open space with a wall and a fork road in this, this area. Um, that took a while, but eventually we discovered this location. So we could see there were details here that matched the video. There was the wall in the distance, the fork in the road, and the buildings. So next we had to be extra sure it was the right location. So what we did is we positioned the camera in Google Earth in the same position as the camera in the video. Now look at the bushes in the background as we merge the two images together. See, the bushes are in exactly the same position when we merge the images together. And there was further confirmation because satellite imagery from after the execution showed track marks and these stains on the ground. And these line up with the blood stains of the execution victims. So you can find the precise location they were executed. What this also tells us is the precise location of the camera. And this means there's another thing we can do. We can not just establish the exact location, but we can actually establish the time because what these people make, the long shadows they're casting, are effectively sundials. Because we know the position of the camera, we can actually find the exact position of those shadows, and that tells us what the time is. So we know it was in the early morning. Um, and we also can see the range of times it could have happened by looking at satellite images for the changes. So we see the change between July 14th and 17th. So just from that one video, we can find the exact location, the date it would have happened, and the exact time it would have happened. Um, so as I said, we're working with these bodies like the International Criminal Court. We've been speaking to the IIIM on Syria and other organizations. Um, now, one big issue that has been coming up, which is relevant to you, is archiving of this material. There's vast amounts of material coming from Syria. Um, it's the same with any conflict now. There's always a huge amount of material. And making that accessible and useful um, is something that we're focused on now. When we first started doing Battling Cat, it was you know me by myself, a few volunteers, and no idea that this stuff would be of interest in the ICC. Now we've been asked to submit evidence for cases related to MH17 and other cases. We've learned that our process for archiving, which really didn't exist back in 2014, has meant that there's a lot of videos and photographs that were shared online that have disappeared. So the question is, how can we actually preserve this stuff in a useful way? So um, we started working with a coalition of organizations, in particular the Global Legal Action Network, to start developing a new process for archiving information and doing investigations in a way that's actually useful and designed around using it in courts. So we worked with the Syrian Archive, uh, who developed a, a platform for archiving material from Syria, and we're now applying to Yemen. And uh, we actually had a hackathon a few uh, months ago where we were joined with everyone listed on this image. We found the best open source investigators we could fi find, and we started using this new process for investigation. And the Global Legal Action Network produced a video describing what we did.
Um, so as you can see, we've got a lot of um, people we're working with in uh, this project, but it, it's really because this brings together um, a, a kind of whole range of skills and areas of interest. Um, we're now launching, or we've launched the Yemen project. If you go to yemen.bellingcat.com, you can see details of the investigations we've done. We've published, I think, 25 so far. Um, these investigations are now being submitted as part of a um, government cons consultation in the UK about arms export agreements to Saudi Arabia. And this is the first time, really, this detailed open source evidence about incidents has been submitted to such an inquiry. Um, if they reject uh, the uh, evidence, that's been, evidence that's been given to them, uh, there'll be a court challenge, which will mean this evidence is then presented to a court. So um, it's quite a big moment. Now, um, this is really the conflict side of what we've been doing at Bell and Cat, but we also focus on other areas. Um, Semi-related to conflict, but... Um, more to Europe, is this social media campaign that ISIS started a few years ago, where they encouraged their followers to um, take photographs of themselves holding a piece of paper in Europe and share it on their Telegram channels. Now, you have three images here. It's, I think it's a bit hard to see the image on the left, but here he's holding up a piece of paper with some plants in the background. Um, so that's not geolocatable. The middle one is taken inside a shop, which might be geolocatable if you have someone who's just happened to take a photograph in that shop, but it seems unlikely. But the middle one is extremely geolocatable. This is taken supposedly in Munster in Germany. Now, what we have here in the background is you can see the bus and you can see this advertising pole. Now, um, Germans are very organized, so they have a website where they actually list all the advertising locations in the entirety of Germany, <laughs> which you can sort by advertising pole. And that gives us a lovely map of Munster where we have all these advertising poles located. And that means we can systematically work our way through each of these locations. It's basically the same principle we've used in our other geolocations. We start with the biggest clue, which is an advertising pole somewhere in Munster, and we start narrowing it down. We can start looking at this imagery. Um, in Munster, they, rather than having satellite imagery, they have this lovely aerial imagery taken from aircraft. So this is much higher resolution. And it means we can look for certain features. We can look, for example, for an intersection and on this intersection, we can see there's various details that can help us geolocate it. So that's the camera position. We can see the utility at uh, the um, advertising poles behind it. We can see these bars that are behind it as well. You can see the road markings. You can see the traffic lights on one side on the road and the other side, and lots and lots of other details. And thanks to this, we're able to geolocate these. And when I say we, what I'm talking about is not Bellingcat, but the community that's around Bellingcat. We use crowdsourcing for this. We saw these, and when you're talking about a location like this, it's not always easy to figure it out, yourself, out by yourself. So we have a big uh, audience who follows us on social media, so we asked them. So this location was found in approximately 10 minutes by someone thanks to crowdsourcing. There were four photographs in total, one in London, which again was done in 10 minutes because someone knew the street. Uh, there was one in Paris where there was a Suzuki logo visible, so we just Googled Paris Suzuki and found five Suzuki shops, and his apartment was the one next door. Um, and the final one was actually at Schiphol Airport. Um, and we, that one took a bit longer because he said he was in Amsterdam, so everyone was looking around Amsterdam, and then in an hour we had the location. So um, this obviously didn't very, work out very well for ISIS, because rather than this scary story about ISIS members being everywhere in Europe, the story was ISIS members in Europe are stupid because they give away their locations. So you would think they wouldn't do that anymore. Well, funnily enough, this week they did it again. So they've asked their followers to do exactly the same thing. So this is somewhere in Turkey. And again, within a very short period of time, we were able to find the exact location the photograph was taken from. Um, so this just is an example of how we can use open source investigation in a slightly different way. Um, even more different is the Europol um, campaign that was launched last year called Stop Child Abuse, Trace an Object. Now here, um, Europol has been asking members of the public if they can look at um, objects they've taken from abuse imagery and help them identify what they are. In many cases, it's the last chance to help these children before these photographs are filed away and forgotten about. So they asked members of the public if they can help. And we saw this campaign, and we have a lot of followers on social media who love doing this sort of stuff. And we shared it with them, and very quickly we were able to find many of these objects and share that information with Europol. Uh, and one of the most early remarkable examples was this image, where they actually showed an entire bedroom. Now, this could be any hotel anywhere in the world. And I think within about 24 hours, someone said, I've stayed at that so same hotel. It's on the island of Mauritius. So literally in the middle of the ocean, and we went to the website, and there was a photograph, different colored bedsheets, but clearly exactly the same room. 
Um, so Europol, after a year, published a video summarising um, what the effect of this campaign had been. We are all part of a community, as are children facing abuse. Trace an object is how you can help them. Victim identification is a task for specialists, but we don't know everything. That's why we need your input to identify specific objects and locations, so victims who have suffered abuse or exploitation can be made safe. The tips you send are really useful. We see the work you've done and how you've used your personal knowledge and skills. We receive a great many tips, too many to give individual feedback, but we appreciate every single one. Our victim identification specialists take your tips and work to verify and develop them further. Sometimes an object is too widely distributed to be of use. We feed this back to colleagues so they can concentrate on other leads instead. Sometimes the tips lead us in a definite direction. We review the information and feed it to the community of investigators. If the information can be used, it is sent for further investigation to the relevant country. This process involves investigation with oversight from supervisors, prosecutors and judges, so all the proper steps are taken to protect the child in the image. We know you're curious about our process. You've asked us why we leave images up when good leads are available. We post the objects on the website in batches and take down batches to ensure the child has the best chance of being identified. These investigations take time, but with your help, it's much faster. You are making it possible for a child who may have lost hope to know that someone cared enough to take the time to rescue them. That's your contribution. Thank you. Um, so one thing that's been really good about this campaign is it's really engaged our audience and some of them really go the extra mile to find out where stuff is. So um, this was a photograph that was published by Europol. Um, this is somewhere in Asia, a rooftop somewhere in Asia. Now Asia is a pretty big place so you would think this would take be impossible. Um, but very quickly in a couple of weeks a Finnish guy who's been following our work called Olieni, he said he had found the exact location and he marked it up like this and we tidied it up to make it look a bit nicer. But he had found the correct location, and this was a big deal because it's somewhere in Asia, and he's found the specific rooftop. Um, and what was really nice about that is he got local media coverage for it in Finland, and it raised the profile of the Europol campaign as well, and got even more people engaged. So by proactively engaging people in their campaign, it doesn't just benefit the ca campaign in a direct way, but it has this secondary effect of raising awareness around it, and it also gives the people who are participating a way to get recognition. Um, we did a training with the BBC a couple of years ago, um, and it was training the BBC Africa, I, um, BBC Middle East team that then became the BBC Africa I team. And one of the journalists there sent this message out afterwards, knowing that we might be able to help. Um, this was a video that was filmed inside the uh, British Virgin Islands. It was just before Hurricane Irma had landed. And it was a British family who was sending a message to their family back home, showing them what the weather was like, and the family had disappeared. Now, the family back in the UK didn't have the address of the family in the British Virgin Islands, but we did have this video. So the question was, where was this family? Because they had gone missing, no one could contact them, no one knew where they were. So how can we find out where they are from this video? Well, one thing we can see in the distance are these islands. And there's a trick uh, we know about Google Earth where it has three-dimensional terrain. So you can move around an area looking for a match to these islands in the distance. And again, we crowdsource this, so there are a bunch of people looking. And eventually, we're able to find the precise location, and we can zoom into it here. So this is on the coast of the British Virgin Islands, and along one stretch of coast you get this view. And this is a very similar view to what you can see in the video. But we can't rely on digital imagery for strong match, so I used another tool. Um, this is a cool called, tool called EchoSec. What it allows you to do is search for geotagged photographs on multiple social media platforms at once. Um, this found this image from Flickr. You can download a lovely high resolution version of it, and then you can compare this view to the view in the video and it seemed that there was a pretty strong match. So this is our first indication this could be the location we're looking for, but it doesn't tell us where the house is because there's a whole bunch of buildings in that area. So next we looked at other details. So 
We believed it was a house because it was a young family. We could see details like the top of the roof here where there's this wedge shape around it, this wooden banister, which again seemed to confirm it was a residential building. And that meant we could look at the satellite imagery of that location and start looking at possible sites. So here you have an area that's an industrial estate, so it wouldn't be there. Here you would expect to see these boats in the foreground, so it was unlikely to be there. And then we had this location. And if we zoom in, we can see there's lots of residential properties, swimming pools, cars and driveway. Right. But the problem was there was no street view imagery. So how do we know which is the correct house? Well, what we do have is lots of images of these houses on estate agent websites and Airbnbs. So we can take a tour of the houses looking at all their wooden furnishings, like the banisters that are visible and the edges of the roofs looking for these wedge shapes. And because all the buildings in that area appear to be unique, there was a very high probability if you found a match, it was going to be the same building. And I found this eventually. And if you look at the photographs, you can see this lovely view. And you can see that these wooden banisters are very, very similar in design. There's also a view of the edge of the house, and if you look at the roof, you can see this wedge shape. So I thought, there, I've got it. And this is what the house looked like on satellite imagery. But I was looking very closely at all these images, and I realized that they'd documented very well the outside of the house looking over the sea. And nothing looked like it actually matched exactly to what was visible in the visible uh, video. So I was a bit confused, scratched my head, and then I started looking around a bit more and saw this house next to it. It's got a swimming pool and an extra building, but the actual main building appears to be identical apart from the color. So I thought, well, maybe this is one of the rare examples in this area where they've used the same design for the house. They've just used different roof tiles. So I called up the estate agent for the first house. He had just sold the second house to a British couple with kids who had been rescued from that house a few days earlier. It was the missing family. And through the estate agents, we were able to contact the missing family with their family back in the UK based off that 12 seconds of video. So this is a very different example of, to what I've shown you before with conflict. Um, this is also semi-conflict related, but this is more about fact checking. So Russia made a very big claim uh, a number of years ago. Um, in the tweet, they're describing these images that appear to be drone images as irrefutable evidence that ISIS are actually covering ISIS combat units to recover their combat capabilities, redeploy, and use them to promote American interests in the Middle East. So directly accusing America of working with ISIS to their own benefit and presenting this as irrefutable evidence. They posted it on Twitter and Facebook, they posted it in English, and they posted it in Russian and Arabic. And this is one of the examples they gave. ISIS automobile convoy leaves Abu Kamar for the Syrian Iraqi border. And I was very confused with this because I had seen this before, two weeks earlier. This Indian journalist had published this uh, video claiming this was live drone action over Mosul. Attached video is of an ISIS convoy trying to resupply fighters in Mosul and being taken out by a predator drone. So what appears to be the same image but in a different context, very confusing. It got even weirder when I, two weeks earlier, had watched this video. So as you'll notice, there's a big red fire bottom on, on the bottom right-hand corner. It also said development footage, this is a working process, all content subject to change. Um, and this is not drone footage, this is footage from a computer game. Um, but I wanted to find the exact computer game, and I looked at this, and I thought this is probably going to be one of those like AC-130 simulators that Call of Duty made popular. So I googled that, and first result was this video, AC-130 gunship simulator. So at the time, I tweeted 10,000 retweets, and it's from a computer game. I was generally quite bitchy about it. But what this did is actually inoculate people against this particular piece of disinformation. Because when Russia used the same computer game image, people reacted very, very, very quickly to point out that this was actually from a computer game. <laughs> um, and these were all people who had been following me who then reacted like almost like white blood cells to that piece of false information. So we wrote a very long article about it, because we always like dunking on the Russian MOD. Um, and Russia then republished their tweet, but this time with m new imagery. But this imagery was so vague and so great, you couldn't figure out where it was, you couldn't figure out if it was new. Um, but by that point, no one really believed Russia. And they posted stuff like this in reply. <laughs> So Russia had initially put that out to make a claim of irrefutable evidence that the US and ISIS were working together. But what it actually resulted in is coverage like this. Lots of major news sites covering the fact they had used computer game imagery as evidence. 
And it crossed over, actually, to the tech press as well. So the tech press gave it lots and lots of coverage as well. Um, and Russia, the Russian MOD even lost Russia Today. Russia Today did a piece on it saying what happened. They said the Russian MOD said it was like an intern who did it by accident. But even they couldn't help resist using the computer game imagery that had been posted before. So when you're Russia, and you're the Russian MOD, and you lose Russia Today, you know you've really messed up. Um, so all these different skills is stuff we want to share and we want to teach people because the more people doing this work, we think the better. Um, so what we've been doing is lots of training sessions. We run five day workshops that you can pay for, but we've also been working uh, with local universities to start putting together a training course. Um, we've been working as well with the Bali and uh, Impact as well to develop these ideas. And what we want to do is work with uh, local people at universities and then expanding it to other civil society groups and you know just interested individuals and teach them how to do open source investigations, not into big wars and stuff like that, but into local issues. We want to connect them to the local press and in some cases even maybe the local government if we find something interesting that we can uh, advocate for. Um, and show people how to do these local investigations and build over years uh, almost grassroots movement of open source investigators in the Netherlands, first focus on local issues, but then focusing on whatever issues they like. Working with universities to develop training courses, develop ideas around open source investigation, um, and hopefully end up with lots and lots and lots of Dutch open source investigators. Um, so that's Bellingcat, and that's what we've been up to. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Elliot. And I'm sure there are plenty of questions in the audience, so I just give the word to you. We have, again, those um, blue speakers. Who is not scared? Hmm? <laughs> ah, sorry. I think we've got someone over there. Yeah, there you go. Well, good afternoon. I'm from the International Criminal Court. So I just want to say thanks for your work and for raising awareness. It's very important. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's another question down here. Okay. <laughs> oh, do you want me to? Oh, I can. Is it working? Okay. Sure. Hi. Um, hi, Elliot. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and for your amazing work. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, you know, we're all coming from the archives community, from the digital preservation community, and I think a lot of us are wondering, like, how can this community support the kind of work you're doing? So I'm just wondering, like, uh, if you could talk a little bit about um, any challenges um, you might have experienced in terms of, like, uh, archiving and preserving the materials that you're working with that have made it more difficult to do the painstaking work of verification that um, you're doing or in making um, the investigations that the, and the materials that you've already collected you know, available to places like the ICC and, and um, other, other mechanisms? Uh, yeah, um, it's really only um, since we started doing this Yemen project this year when we've really seriously thought about how we archive material because it has become a big issue um, when we've gone back and submitted stuff for the MH17 case because stuff's just gone and we've used sites like archive.today and archive.org uh, which don't always work that well with the archiving and it's not really how you want to be doing archiving. But there also has to be a balance in a way between as Bellingcat professionalizes and does serious archiving, understanding that there's still going to be groups out there who are using these kind of archiving websites. So that's one area we're trying to address even as we're kind of improving our own archiving process. Um, it's also the question of how uh, we can archive our investigations as they're happening. So we've been working with the creator of Hunchly to um, solve that issue. We've been working with the Syrian Archive to look at how we can start integrating, um, you know, if we find an interesting video, how we can quickly get it onto the archive rather than having to do loads of downloads and button presses. It's really about taking the investigation process and then taking the archiving part of that and making it as simple as possible for the user, but also by making it simple, not also making it useless for the actual purpose at the end of it. So um, we are making progress in that area, I'm glad to say. Um, I'm hoping, I was, 
maybe by the end of spring next year that we'll have a kind of full package of investigation and archiving protocols that we can use internally uh, and then share with other organizations who want to do it. Um, then on top of that, there's the question of indexing. Now, there's um, a lot of issues we're encountering where there's lots of different groups making their own archives in different ways. Um, and that means that organizations like the IIIM on Syria, for example, who are trying to collect this information have a big challenge because they need to reach out to, say, 20 different organizations, asking them about the same incident, often in different ways because they might not describe it in the same way, expecting 20 different data sets, and it becomes a massive and complex data management task. What we're also trying to do in, along creating this archiving pro protocols is create um, an indexing system that can sit on top of it that's independent, that's separate from the archive, but but allows people to still control their archives and what's shared with the index, but that index makes all those archives searchable from one place rather than having this huge complex issue. So it's, it's meaning that groups like the ICC or the IIIM, if they come to groups like Bellingcat in the future, hopefully there'll be a lot more Bellingcats or just one really big Bellingcat, um, is um, that rather than having to search 20 different archives, they can just do one simple search on this index and it will tell them where this information is and they can make requests for this information. Because otherwise, Otherwise, what we're going to find in the future is um, bodies like the IIIM, like the IC, are just swamped with digital information that hasn't been organized, that isn't in all kinds of different data formats, and it'll just stop the operation of those organizations doing what they need to do. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for this um, admirable uh, presentation on your work. I, actually, I have... Um, a, a simple question, um, and maybe a more compl complicated one. Um, first, uh, I would like to understand why you call this open source investigation, um, because in in the field of open source, the understanding of open source is different. I would understand it as open data or mm -hmm. investigations based on open data. So that's just curiosity. And maybe the more difficult question is, uh, how do you work with social media platforms? Because a lot of the evidence you're gathering is coming from social media platforms. And more specifically, are you able to exploit metadata associated with those um, materials you're gathering from social media platforms? And do you have agreements with those platforms to be able to e extract useful information, um, geolocation, for example, or IP addresses, and so on and so forth? So. Um I'll give you the long version of the open source answer. So, so basically when this kind of community appeared online, um, it happened kind of in, uh, around basically the Arab Spring. As people from lots of different backgrounds, there were journalists from Storyful, uh, um, myself, just people who were really interested in the subject, and we didn't in a way really have a language to explain what we were doing. Like I didn't know when I geolocated that first video I was doing geolocation because no one had really started using the word in that sense. There's other ways you were, use the word geolocation. So in a way, we were kind of borrowing words as a community from other communities that seemed to fit. So one of the first things, we used to describe what we did as uh, OSIN, open source intelligence, because that was the closest it was. But now we're moving away from that term because uh, open source intelligence suggests a very specific intelligence project. Uh, so we've, we've um, decided to use the term online open source investigation because that is kind of more accurate with what we're doing. So we're talking about open source material, which is just any publicly available material, effectively. Um, on your other question with the social media platforms, um, we have a, a relationship with them that is not always smooth. So the most recent issue we've had is Facebook removing graph search which was an incredibly useful tool for open source investigators to use complex Facebook search terms to find information. It was also really good for the like of uh, you know, Russian hackers and the Cambridge Analytica to scrape tons of information about people and target them. So Facebook decided to shut that down, which removed a very, very useful open source investigation tool from us. Um, on the other hand, Facebook has also been quite engaged on the topic of um, troll farms and uh, inauthentic behavior on their network. So um, several weeks ago, we published an article about um, Saudi Arabia cyber operations, uh, including a bit about possible activity on Facebook. Facebook saw that article and actually started investigating what we discovered and discovered a large Saudi influence network that they then shut down. Um, and they then contacted us and said, if you have any more information like this, we want to know about it because we do want to shut this down. So. Um, as part of this now, I'm working with other bodies who are kind of doing this kind of work. So we now have a way to actually let Facebook know. It, on Twitter, we've met with them and discussed stuff with them. Mainly on Twitter, it's just 
you know, trolls and people acting strange, but there is this, this bot issue, and sometimes we've identified bot networks as well. Um, Google actually was interesting, because very early on in 2012, they're actually very engaged on issues around the Arab Spring, because they saw YouTube and the platforms they had as a way to get people, uh, you know, help people in these Arab countries, you know, find democracy and freedom. Then in 2014, um, ISIS started posting all their videos on it, and that changed very, very rapidly. Um, so there was this initial really big interest in what I was doing at Balancade, and they kind of invited me in and you know I demonstrated what I do with Google Earth and they got very excited because they thought it was cool and then um, that's kind of gone away to a certain extent because now they're really concerned about shutting down all the ISIS videos and getting rid of all this terrorist content but even within that my own accounts have been shut down twice by Go uh, YouTube for violating terms of service because of the videos I've posted in relation to our investigations um, so you know, even I've got caught up in what was supposed to be something that was only targeting, you know, terrorist supporters. Um, but yeah, it's it's an ongoing relationship. It's complicated. I mean, the the fact of life is these social media platforms are used by investigators. So it, it would be very easy to say, well, you know, screw Facebook and screw Google. We hate them, but we have to work with what they produce. And um, that's just part of the relationship. And finally, on metadata and, and agreements, we don't have, a, apart from what I mentioned with Facebook, where we let them know if we've come across an influence network or suspected one, um, we um, don't get any additional metadata. It's like they won't give us stuff that they've deleted off the platforms, which is sometimes annoying. Um, it, it's like we discovered a video from Yemen about an airstrike, and it was a really, really important video. We looked at it, and within five minutes, it had been deleted from uh, YouTube. And it appears that it was deleted because we looked at it, and it triggered some sort of algorithm, and made kind of put it to the top of the pile to be looked at. And we lost this really important piece of evidence, and they won't restore it. So, and it, we don't have any way to. We can't just stamp our foot and demand they restore it. I mean, they have other issues to deal with. So, um, unfortunately, that's something we've had to. We've learned that now when we look at a video, we make a copy of it immediately before some algorithm decides it shouldn't be seen by anyone. Oh, I see a lot of hands. Yeah, up there. How do you ensure the provenance of the data and the tools you're using? Um, that's a tricky one. So, um, I mean, with the tools, often they're kind of quite commonly well known. I mean, like with Hunchley, for example, we know the author and we can contact him continually about stuff and he's actually made modifications to help us with our investigations. There's some other tools that are a little bit more suspicious. So there's been a recent raft of um, tools from Russia uh, allowing you to do reverse image searches on people's faces through their social media site, vcontactor.com. And it's a very, very powerful tool. If you find any photograph of someone and you plug it into these tools, they'll find their social media profile. Um, this has been abused in various ways. For example, um, uh, in Russia, they started using it to shame adult film actresses in Russia by tracking down their social media profiles from screenshots from those films. Um, it's been used in various unpleasant ways, but these tools keep getting shut down and popping up again because they're proving to be so popular. We actually used one recently in an investigation where we were looking for a missing person to help the police find a missing person's uh, social media account. So it can be useful, it can be bad, but you're plugging in photographs to an unknown service that's based in Russia. So God knows what they're doing with those photographs that you're sharing with them. So sometimes it's hard to know which tools are more trustworthy and which aren't. You might even say that maybe even Google is an untrustworthy tool if you're using it for storing data. Um, so there's that. And then on the evidence itself, first we look at where were these videos published. So with Syria, for example, we understood how social media is being used. As I described, they did it in a fairly systematic way. So if a video was posted to a brand new YouTube channel that didn't seem to be connected to anything, that was very unusual. And a number of fake videos about Syria have been shared in that way. Um, with MH17, it was a bit different because you had a mass of people using social media. Um, so very quickly, you had lots of videos and photographs being shared of the missile launcher that shot, we discovered shot down MH17 being transported through Ukrainian territory. So the first thing we did is geolocate these photographs, see where they actually were, were they in eastern Ukraine, were they along a route that was sensible, were the time of day they appear to have been taken match with what we knew. Um, but then we started looking for other information because in some of these cases, we didn't have the original source where these were posted. So what we started to do is look for other evidence. We looked for people on social media at the time they saw the missile launcher before MH17 was shot down, 
basically talking about it, saying, I've just seen a big missile launcher driving down the street in my town, which just matched the time site matching the date of the route. Uh, there are other sources, like journalists on the ground who saw it before MH17 was shot down, and then people afterwards who followed it up by going to the locations, taking photographs, confirming it was the same location. Um, so what we start doing is, rather than looking at one object, is explore the kind of nexus of information around it. And if it appears to be isolated from other information that we know about the topic, then that's suspicious. So we start digging into it. We say, why does this object exist on the internet when it appears not to match other information that we have? Maybe it tells us that the other information we have is wrong, but in more cases, it tells us that this object is a fabrication of some sort. I was told we have some more time for a few more questions. There, I see a hand there. I just see the hand, so that's oh, This is cool. Um, so great, thank you very much, that was fantastic. It was, um, it was too amazing to tweet. Um, twi <laughs> the Twitter world just went quiet while you were talking. Um, I'm interested in the reverse side. So you've done a lot of fact checking about what's fake and what's not right. What about a stamp of authority for certificating what is true? sort of flipping the model, could, could, could a news organisation or an archive or someone responsible for content come to you and say, can you just check these things for us? Can we put a Bellingcat True sign on them? Um, not to quite that extent. I mean, we do often have people coming to us asking about specific footage and information, and sometimes it's real and sometimes it's not, and we explain why we've believed we've come to the, our conclusion about something. So anything we're fact-checking, we explain why we've come to that conclusion, and that just helps people make their, their own mind. Um, now, in a way, what we're trying to do at the moment with the kind of justice and accountability thing is discover, is there a way we can make meet a certain standard that means that a judge who will look at it will accept it as evidence, or that it can be explained in a court in a way that it's actually useful, because um, it's not really been tested that much so far, and because we find ourselves at the forefront of various investigations, like with MH17 and Syria and Yemen at the moment, um, this question keeps coming up to, to the various bodies we're talking to. We've spoken to UN bodies, groups like the ICC, Europol, you know, the question is, how can we be sure that we can use this in court without embarrassing ourselves? That's what everyone's scared of. They don't want to take the leap to be first. So this is why we have lots of meetings and discussions, and we kind of role play some of this stuff as well, just to see where the weakness is in our is really in our own work, so that we can start addressing this. And this is where, with the Yemen project, we hope we have, but we're at the point now where the scary bit, where we're actually submitting it to a real government inquiry. And if they turn back and say we don't take social media posts, then it's going to be an issue. Um, we'd think they'd be wrong for doing that, but then we have to make our arguments to why to the wider community. Thank you. Is there, okay. uh, is there someone else? The last question, maybe? Take your chance. <laughs> no? Okay, yeah. Uh, in front. Uh, slightly off the topic of digital preservation, like, are you safe? Do you get death threats? Like, <laughs> like you, you know, you and your organisation, like, I'm just, you must do, surely. I'll list them off. Um, so, um, I mean, Russia, as you can imagine, is very displeased with us. There, we've had lots of attacks in Russian media against our work. Uh, we've had Russian government officials claiming that we use fakes and that we're working with the British government. We've been targeted by Fancy Bear and the Cyber Burkett in various um, attacks on our sites and attempts to access our emails. Um, we've had um, the Internet Research Agency produce all kinds of articles about Bellingcat and propagate them through their network, trying to smear us. Um, yeah, so that's some of it. We've started doing work on the far right in um, Eastern Europe as well, which has obviously not gone very, worked down very well with a lot of neo-Nazis. So um, the last video we had with that, on that was uh, we exposed a Telegram channel that was selling translations of the um, manifesto of the Christchurch shooter. And we published it, and they reacted very, very badly to it, and they posted a video online that shows um, uh, basically our, uh, the writers who worked on that basically printed out, put on balloons, and they blast them with shotguns and say, basically, you're next. Um, so there are, that has been reported up to the kind of police and kind of appropriate people. But yeah, it does uh, put us in the firing line, like literally in some cases. So um, yeah, we, we have to be cautious though in our own personal security. A lot of it from Russia and stuff is cybersecurity. We've probably upset the Saudis as well now we've got their influence network shut down and 
publishing stuff about Yemen, so we have to worry about that as well. So um, it's something we're very vigilant to, I would say. Just thank you for everything. Oh, it was you. amazing. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think this is a very nice end, but I, there's something else I have to grab. Just wait a second. <laughs> Um, because it comes back to where I started about not being scared, and that's obviously <laughs> you're not scared you're, uh, from that question. So when I when I told when I was um, told that I'm going to moderate your keynote, of course I was very excited, <laughs> and I went to my office colleague, and that's what she held up. I don't know if you know that. Oh, bad in the, the, the cat picture, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> oh, that was really nice. That was really a coincidence. So I thought, you know, this it's is nice as well because <laughs> I don't believe in coincidence. Most people think that we're the cat, but we're the mice. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>